Welcome. You're watching Ask Your Father, a Guadalupe Media Production. It's a show where we get to ask our priests questions, questions that are on our minds. And we're blessed to have with us today Father Scott. Welcome, Father Scott. Welcome. Uh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks <laughs> always a pleasure to have you. You're That's one of the originals, you know, Father. All the way back. Huh? Of course, of course. And you're always brave enough to come and answer the questions. <laughs> As best as I can, huh? Uh, of course. Thank you very much. Um, today we'll be talking about the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Oh, mm -hmm. oh yes. Oh, yes. Very important to talk about the Blessed Mother. How important a role she play in our faith as Catholics. Yeah. I, I, I just... Uh, Jump just, in by men, yeah, <laughs> just, just by speaking about her, it, it, it does. It, it's when you speak about your mother. When you speak, it, it, it moves to a certain emotion. It does move your heart. Mm. Especially personally, personally, she's been always. I would not be here without her intercession. Of course. Of you know, course. sometimes people ask me, "How do you become a priest?" Mm -hmm. And I had to be sincere. As, as, as her blessed mother, mm. as she, she she did it. And I, people may say what they want to say, but I know I love Jesus the way I do today because of her. And, uh, and I can't, if I were to say anything other than that, I'd be lying. Hmm? That, and, is, that, is, that is important to know, Father. Yeah. And, and uh, also, uh, coming from the salt formation, which is where you are, I know she plays a very important role sure, I, for I, you as well. Salt, S-O-L-T, it's, it's uh, I guess, Father Jim Blunt, we're yes. familiar with, um, Father John Robinson serving over in Ben Cave, you know, of Father course. The, the, the acronym it means the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity. Yeah, so yeah. these two great mysteries, the, the Most Holy Trinity is there, yeah, and but then of course Our Lady and her relationships with the persons of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. And so the foundation and the journeys it always points and we walk with our Blessed Mother. Mm -hmm. um, one of the ways that we um, encourage people to grow in that devotion mm -hmm. or their relationship with the Blessed Mother is through one of the saints' contribution to the church. It's St. Louis de Montfort. Mm -hmm. He wrote a book, True Devotion uh, to Mary. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, it's a prophetic book. It's a prophetic book, and um, it just speaks about the logic and the theology and the saints that have been devoted completely to Mary, mm -hmm. to be completely devoted to Jesus. Sometimes people say things that somehow getting in the way of Jesus. We think sometimes I've heard that right, quite a bit, some, even from some of our own. Uh, well, Catholics. I understand it's a way of thinking of things in efficiency. I think it's the same way why maybe the Pharisees thought going to Jesus would get in the way of going to the Father. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's a misunderstanding what we mean by mediation, and even the mystical body of Christ. That, that if you're thinking of distance or efficiency or a race or something, okay, perhaps in space and time that that may get in the way. But you're thinking along the areas of relationships and family. Um, an extra child doesn't take away, I guess it's not a little, children may get jealous of their newborn child. But in time, you hope they would mature over that way of thinking, realize that one extra child to the family only enriches it. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't get in the way of the way mom loves you. It actually just enriches the family. And, That's a very and good way of it. looking at it. And so if you look at the church as a family, I think the, the difficulty when people say, mis misunderstand our Blessed Mother, very often, I think it's a misunderstanding first of the church. In the, early, in the first century, they very often, they spoke about this relationship of the Blessed Mother and then the church as a mother. And the, nowadays, we seem to have lost that. We seem to have lost that Mary's mother of the church. Sometimes the church is seen as an institution. Or Here in Belize, we have great relationships with our non-Catholic brothers and sisters, and thank God. You know, we, we love the scriptures, we work of mercy, and we do many works together. And I think it's a beautiful part of the way the church has grown today. But at the same time, we have to recognize uh, our definitions of church isn't the same. Right? We're not just talking about a spiritual church, right? There's, there's something very different when we speak of the church. We believe that God is not just spiritual now, he became flesh, yes. Jesus. Yes. And so likewise, that mystery of the incarnation, it continues in, in how we understand the church. It's not just an invisible church, a spiritual church, but it's also a visible church. Mm -hmm. And so we say it's one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. Anyway, long, long that difference, anyway, sometimes uh, leads to a, a difference of how we understand the role of Mary in the church. And Pope Francis just recently uh, proclaimed, and that's the universal church to have a new feast day. 
in the church. An emphasis. A new feast day of an old title of Our Lady. Yeah, of and the day, at Monday after Pentecost, is now proclaimed to celebrate for all churches throughout the world, the Catholic churches, uh, Mary, Mother of the Church, Mata Ecclesia. And it's a new, it's a beautiful feast of our, our, beloved, our blessed, blessed Mother that was pronounced um, in a unique way in Vatican II. At the end, closing of Vatican II, Pope Paul VI, he used this title of Mary, Mother of the Church, and he asked that she would be venerated and honored mm -hmm. under that title. And the moment that happened, she began to be honored under that title in the homes of the faithful. Mm -hmm. And eventually, 10 years later, um, in, the next, in the next decade, he, he wrote the first, uh, first Mass uh, uh, under this title, encouraging it. And now, it has been made over these years with Pope Francis, and it's made a universal feast day. And this, but what, what's going on there, right? And Mary is mother of the church. I think it's a, uh, it's a powerful uh, truth. Uh, speaking about how another title of Mediatrix of all graces, that the graces of God that come to us, come to us through Mary. Um, and this is, if you don't look at the church that way as a mother, as an institution, or if it's just, even just the, 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 the group of faithful that come together in general, yeah. um, it's very hard to speak about um, the, and, and this is with great respect, right? But of course, it's very hard to speak about the evangelical church. Yeah. Quite white, rightly, they say it's an alliance or the evangelical churches. They don't necessarily have a certain creed that they all write down and they agree upon, yeah. right? But if Jesus Christ has one church and one truth, uh, yes. um, he, he's the head and he has one body, right? He doesn't, he's the bridegroom and the church is his bride and he doesn't get multiple wives. No, no, no. And no, so no. there's a, it's true that we're all striving. There's people within the Catholic Church that maybe remain in the church and body, but not in heart. Mm -hmm. Just because you're baptized Catholic and you receive your sacraments doesn't mean you'll be saved. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's also very true that there's many of our brothers and sisters that are not in the visible church, but are living in the gospel. They are disciples. You know, like, and that's the question, who's the disciple? Huh? But, but Father, to get back to sure. the importance of the Blessed Mother, because some people really do take it all the way. They're very serious about their dedication to the Blessed Mother. You know, you would see an altar at their home, and you wouldn't even see Jesus, their God. You would see the Blessed Mother adorned. Sure. And, uh, you know, they would do a lot of things just for the Blessed Mother. Right. And it seems uh, that uh, the other, the son, and even the father are put aside because of the Blessed Mother. That, how, do you, how do you sure. speak that, to that? That is a common, I'm glad you brought that up, there's a common misunderstanding that that somehow is wrong. If, and anything that um, you begin to realize that it is impossible, properly understood, right? Mm -hmm. If people are properly educated and taught, you cannot honor Mary without her honoring Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it, it's a misunderstanding to think that there's some separation between Jesus and Mary in a way that they, they don't move together. He's the king of the, the, king, the new creation, huh? and she's the queen, yeah. the queen mother. Huh? And this is, this, is a, this is a very important understanding. So the more you honor Our Lady, the more you honor Jesus. Somehow we see Mary and Jesus as in, in competition, mm -hmm. right? But it's not really, I don't think we quite understand the, the flow and workings of grace when that happens. And it's, a, it's actually St. Louis de Montfort in his Book. That's one of the uh, the, the false devotions, a uh, uh, risk, a uh, temptation against this honoring of our Blessed Mother. Mm -hmm. Somehow that Mary would get jealous of Jesus, or she's going to bring the glory to herself, like we think in our fallen nature. Mm -hmm. But remember, she's full of grace. Yeah, yeah. She has no sin, and she, she 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 was when she was praised by Elizabeth, who was filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes. Right? Blessed are you. Blessed are, blessed are the fruit of your womb. Right? Blessed are you among women. Among women. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. And she proclaimed, she's the one who believed that everything that the Lord has spoken of her would happen. And did she say, yes, I'm the mother of God, come worship me? No, oh, my God. soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And the very moment she's praised, she's in her thanksgiving praising God. Mm -hmm. And if that's the way it works, how can you put Mary before Jesus? It's very, it's wrong. If it happens, it happens in a, in a misunderstanding, an error in theology in someone's mind in the way they worship, right? But we outside can't judge someone's heart and say, you're putting Mary before Jesus. That is, that you're going to a place where you just can't go. And that's true. Many 
Nine Catholics looks at uh, a, a, a mother, a, a woman, or a man kneeling before the statue of Mary and say, "You're worshiping her," yeah. and and that's that's a judgment of the heart. That's you true. can't do that. That's true. And, but uh, unfortunately, I'm glad you bring it up. Sometimes our Catholics we're a little shy about it. Right, we don't put a statue of Mary on our lawn because we're afraid it will be a little bit difficult. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I don't think I don't think we we want to hold back our love of our mother. We want to respect the consciences of other people and enter into dialogue and try to help people understand what why is she so united with Mary? Well, I mean, excuse me, she's so united with Jesus. Exactly. You know, and I think um, it, it's incredibly important because, in truth, there's not one grace we receive from Jesus that doesn't come through Mary. The very incarnation, mm-hmm. Jesus was presented to the world True. through the womb of Mary. Yeah. And he's everything. So you can say, like, every grace comes through the, the, the heart and womb of Mary. Mary. That is, that is so Because every grace comes from Jesus. And, and you find, Father, that it's the easiest way that yeah. maybe the evangelicals or others find to attack us Catholics. That whole notion of how much we, sure. how much attention we give to the Blessed Mother, even uh, even though it doesn't exist in the Bible, they would say. Sure, yeah, they would say a lot of things. But I would say, um, I, I don't think it's the easiest way. I think it's it's the most common way. Common way. That's what. But that's uh, it's what not I the mean. easiest because actually, there's all kinds of um, uh, defense in Scripture, mm-hmm. sacred tradition, the lives of the saints, and personal experiences that we have in the church. There's no shortage. Of the impact of the mediation and the unique role Mary has as mother of mother of God, yes. you know. But I think because of misunderstanding, it becomes very common. Unfortunately, I think as Catholics, we don't do a very good job defending her because mm-hmm. we get, get a little lazy, maybe, or we get a little shy. And uh, I think sometimes we we need to not I wouldn't say in a combative way, but simply speak about that. Exactly. And I, we, we could even speak about that right now. Yeah, to like some of those things like. Um, one, one common one is that one very important truth, and it's related to what we're speaking about, is the Immaculate Conception of Mary. Yes, that, 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 that again is a, one of the big questions I have for you, Father. This Immaculate Conception, how do we know that? Sure. And, you know, which is almost impossible in, 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 in real life. Sure. Talk to us about that. Well, it's also impossible for God to become man. Right, and so the, so the very fact that we're Christian, so there's a lot of impossibilities, and then of course, Christopher says, with God, all things are possible. Of course, right. But uh, the the Immaculate Heart of Mary is there's evidence in different areas. I think firstly, you can, we talk, can talk about apparitions, right? Mm. The, um, uh, if you actually, if you allow me, let me just kind of reason through it first, so and then we can go into yeah. the other sources. Please, please break it down for us. Just, um, I, I think I, the best way is through a story. I remember. I, I think I shared this with you before, but I remember I was in seminary, and it was in philosophy. As a Catholic priest, you spend many years in philosophy, tr- studying and, and reading these, these these books, and so, it, you get a little heady, you know. Of course. And so I love for the opportunity sometimes when we weren't in our classes to work. We lay tiles and and we were painting, build, uh, building a house or something. Like that. And one of the things we could do is we started a garden, uh-huh. and we had some guys that had some experience. And I was just the worker, you know, and. Uh, I, I just love to be out in the garden, just working. And so we started this garden and we just planted the seeds and the, the, the tilling the soil and the watering every day. And we didn't have any, any system, so you would get these buckets and put holes in the bottom and carry these water buckets over the, over the plants that were gradually growing. And it was so exciting when you start to see it grow, right? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And then it's all, it really is quite exciting. And then when it bears fruit and the fruit gets in harvest time, and long story short, we began harvest and we had these turnips. And, we brought them in, and I was so proud of the first harvest. <laughs> Cleaned it and chopped them up and, and put them in, put them right there in the kind of salad area where people could come in through and, and uh, get their, their lunch. And before the first person got through, and I was sure enough telling everyone how <laughs> this is the festivals from the garden, you know, <laughs> and a visiting priest he walked in and he said, Where were these, plant- where are these vegetables from? So, and they said, oh, there's a, there's a garden right out back and this land right behind us. I mean, that land? And he says, that land is toxic. Oh my, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> my whole heart dropped, you know? 
<laughs> and what do you think? What do you think people did when they walked by? Of course, they, 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 they passed. <laughs> they passed. They passed the toxic, <laughs> the toxic food. Well, I got my spoon. I <laughs> filled my whole plate up with them. I start eating it. You know, <laughs> it's not toxic. Are you anyway. still alive? <laughs> I'm still alive. And that, but it's interesting though. Like when you begin to saw when everyone recognized. When they just saw the fruit, they said, okay, this is great. But when they saw the soil, or they, someone suggested the soil was toxic or something wrong with the soil, they believed something was wrong with the fruit. Mm -hmm. right? But then, likewise, if you have pure soil, right, and the fruit comes from it, organic fruit, or whatever, right? you sometimes say that, you sometimes have this, you see something, the value of the fruit. Mm -hmm. So look at Our Lady and the fruit of her womb. If we insult, or we say there's some stain or sin in the Blessed Mother, in some way, the smallest sin, that then you're saying something must be wrong with the fruit, okay. the fruit of her womb. Yeah. And so when we say Mary's immaculately conceived, it's not for Mary's sake, but it's for the fruit of her womb. It's because, she's, because Jesus is God, he could not take flesh in any other womb if it was defiled by sin. And so there's the, the, this is the kind of the logic behind it. But I can, we can talk about which, support which, which later. makes perfect sense. You know, come in, it has to be something pure to, to, to bring forth Jesus. Simple. Yeah. Oh boy. We'll continue on this trend, Father. Sure. We have a lot more to talk about. Okay. Uh, you're watching Ask Your Father. We'll go to our first break. See you in a few. Welcome back. You're watching Ask Your Father, and with me we have Father Scott. Kind of breaking it down to us about the Immaculate Heart of Mary, about the Blessed Mother. And we left the last segment talking about the Immaculate Conception, sure. which, uh, you know, has a lot of implications. And I kind of like the analogy you gave with uh, your, your garden and, and the vegetables coming from a toxic soil. Can we get back to that conversation, Father, sure. uh, to talk about the Immaculate Conception and, and, you know, how that is where we are today? Yeah, it's incredibly important for our holiness, I feel like. Our Lady, because of all the, all, every grace that God gives us, the Most Holy Trinity gives His Church, comes through her heart, um, it is the secret to great holiness and sanctity. And uh, so this dialogue needs to happen in our church, needs to happen with our non-Catholic Christian brothers and sisters. It needs to happen with those who don't believe in Jesus. She is um, she's a mysterious woman, you know, and beautiful. Even our uh, Muslims, they honor Mary, you know, in a wonderful way. Even in their Quran, it doesn't talk about uh, Muhammad had was born of regular parents. In the Quran, it speaks about the the virgin birth, you know, where she she was. She gave birth to Jesus as a virgin, and so she. This woman is is is, is with great mystery and great honor, and, and, and especially as Catholics, we, we believe that it has been re revealed to us fully and continues to be revealed to us, especially in these times, where she in the scriptures she's very hidden. Not much scripture is being written about her. She speaks very succinctly but powerfully in the words in her presence. That's right. Uh, but she. For, for she needed to get a back seat, so to speak, for Jesus. Huh? And, and, and she did, you know. And probably. she did. And one, one particular uh, uh, story, Bible story that I, I, I like with her was at the wedding at Cana. Okay. When um, she, Jesus didn't even know that his time has come, but his mother knew, the blessed mother knew. Yeah. And she told him, you know, do whatever he says. Right. And he told her, well, you know, my time has not yet come. And she said, don't worry about him. Just do as he says. <laughs> you know, I'm saying that how we probably say it today. But how did she know that? So she must have had special graces and special, it must have been special about the Blessed Mother. No, yeah. If you, even just that she was one of the few people at the foot of the cross when Jesus died. Mm -hmm. When everyone else, even the apostles, ran. What, how did she have the strength to stand there? Yeah, you know, yeah, even, that's true. so many way, different ways. Um, uh, but now, as we go into this mystery of this beautiful woman, the Immaculate Conception, she, um, uh, first of all, what does it mean, right? The Immaculate Conception isn't the virgin birth, and sometimes people make that conf confusion. They think the Immaculate Conception is Jesus. Mm. And it's true that Jesus had no sin, right? But he is he's God, right? Who became man. Mm -hmm. Our Blessed Mother is not God. 
And this is why Catholics don't worship her as much as people want to feel that they say that Catholics do. And if they, they just don't. Um, uh, she is not God. She's a human creature, a beautiful woman, but she's the most exalted creature of all creation. And that's important to say. Like, the most exalted creature, creature of all creation is a woman. Mm-hmm. And the church teaches this, right? Reminds us of this over and over again. And then, but she's, she has been, she, the scripture says, she has pronounced by the angel Gabriel, she is full of grace. Mm-hmm. And that's very important to ponder. Right? Really, when she, we're, we're speaking about the Immaculate Conception, the, actually I have a, the dogma, the proclamation. This was, it was proclaimed officially, right? So this is believed through the church fathers from before St. Augustine, right? So this is something that the church has always believed. But when the dogma has proclaimed for some reason in time, this is an important time the church wanted to say, hey, listen to this. So it was in December 8th, 1854, Pope Pius IX gave this proclamation infallibly. Right? This is a dogma. If you, you are believing the gospel, you must believe this. Right? What is a dogma, Father? A dogma is an official dogma. teaching given the authority. Jesus promised the Holy Spirit would guide the church in all truth. St. Mm-hmm. Paul is a, says if he is away, he must follow the church, which is the pillar and the the foundation of truth. So this is official church doctrine. With the authority, in this particular case, it was a, there's different ways it can happen, but this was a, the authority of the Holy Father, the Bishop Great. of Rome, going back to Peter. Great. Okay, and, and it's only like the one sentence, right? It's a whole letter, and this is what he says. The most holy virgin, Mary, was, in the first moment of her conception, by a unique gift of grace and privilege of Almighty God, and in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Redeemer of mankind, Preserved free from all stain of original sin. So when everyone else is born, we are somehow that effect of the Adam and Eve, the, the first man and first woman. That sin somehow, we, the humanity is all connected. So all creation suffers this sickness. We all are affected by it. And there's no hope for us because we're all infected from it. Whatever we try to reach into to find the remedy for it, that self is infected by this original sin. And so every child that comes into it, now don't confuse that with personal sin. Personal sin, when you're old enough, you make a choice. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's personal sin. There's a dis- distinction between original sin and personal sin. sin. And so, but there is an inclination to, to darken our intellect and weaken our will, have disordered emotions. These effects of sin are in each one of us by just the fact that we were born. And this effect from, from uh, this, this sin that is in, in our community, in, our, in humanity. Um, but our Blessed Mother, what we're saying is that she was preserved from any kind of, uh, uh, any kind of uh, effect of that. So she was never in the kingdom of Satan at all. And our baptism is an exorcism prayer. I always prayed over the, the baby, the adult that enters in. And in, in, in you, where you turn from the kingdom of darkness towards the kingdom of light. And so this, this turning away from darkness to light, you're, you're moving away from being under this influence of the evil one to, to the, living as a child of God through the sacraments of the church and grace. Yes, she, being full of grace, if you're full of something, you can't have any, you can't have any taint of sin. Mm-hmm. She was never an, in, under that kingdom and domain, and hence, she's the woman that crushes the head of the serpent. She always has a victory. She's the woman of the new creation, the new covenant, if you will. Mm-hmm. It's from every moment. However, this does not mean, and they were very clear, it says, in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Pope said. Mm-hmm. Those words are very important because it wasn't just by her own power. It was a complete gift of God. And the, why she had this unique gift it was by the power of Jesus Christ, who is God. Mm-hmm. So God existed since the beginning of time. So God the Son was, existed. So he, we, if we, you could create your mother, you could create her perfect. Mm-hmm. If you could, but you can't, and neither can I. Yeah, yeah, but God the Son could. And did. He did, he did. And he made her the most beautiful of all women. Even before. And so that by the merits that he knew that he would do in the future, he applied the merits of the cross to the Blessed Virgin Mary before uh, any kind of effects of original sin, thus preserving her from sin and yeah. in, in her conception and throughout her life. So she would have this, this, this womb in which he would eventually assume a human nature to be in our salvation. She was, she was around when Jesus died, of course, at the cross. Uh, when did she die? At what age? Is there any, any documentation um, of that? The, the did she die? Yeah, that is a very good question. It's another, 
Um, question. There's two thoughts, and the church has not given a dogma on that. Mm -hmm. And there's a dogma of the, of the assumption. Because she had no sin, one argument is saying, well, sin corrupts us. Because of sin, we fall into corruption. Okay, and we wait the resurrection of the body. But if the Blessed Mother did not have sin, she doesn't affect, suffer the effects of sin. Therefore, she shouldn't suffer corruption. The other, uh, uh, and death. The other argument is, well, she wanted to uh, imitate Jesus and share in Jesus whatever he has shared in. So as Jesus truly died, she herself wanted to share that death to be in union with Christ. Mm -hmm. And so the, this is the two arguments that go back and forth, and you're free to believe whichever one that may be. In the East, they usually speak of the Dormition, yeah. where she had this, this slip, fell asleep and then basically was taken up to heaven. And we emphasize the assumption and we leave that open. We so yeah. I guess we're uh, to, to the church. To, to so there's no official dogma in that one yet? That, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. no, not, and, and it's... Uh, it's I guess it's an area that's not really essential for our salvation. Mm -hmm. Like, let's say, the Immaculate Conception. Yeah. And that's hard to say. Like, to, to, because why we have to believe in the Immaculate Conception is because we believe Jesus is God. And to understand that relationship with Jesus and Mary is really to understand Jesus' plan of salvation mm -hmm. in his fullness. It's, uh, he was fully human, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and being fully human, he, he, was also, he was also fully God. I also want to, to ask, exactly, Father. I also want to ask about the Israel, the fact that she was a perpetual virgin. And are we referring to the virginity that we, we know about, the biological virginity today? Sure. Um, she was married. Did she have any other children? Right. How can we say that she was a, a virgin through life? If you look at Joseph, you know, who was a very faithful Jew, you know, mm -hmm. and he was brought into this mystery, right? And he was entrusted with, with uh, to raise Jesus. And he knew that she was, she was found with child during the time of the betrothment. Mm -hmm. right? So that's the time in the Jewish preparations when they're committed and legally married before the, a couple sleeps with one another and consummates the marriage. Mm -hmm. Joseph found Mary with a child. Mm -hmm. okay? And then it's a, a message from the angel in a dream. So, but that, they were already betrothed to each other. They were, right? they were betrothed, betrothed. And, and that yeah. meant they were, in the Jewish understanding, they were legally married. Right. And so what they do, the husband and wife live separately until the time the father and the groom chooses, and he prepares his place, and he comes and picks up the bride, with his, and the celebration begins. They consummate the marriage at that moment, and they begin a seven-day celebration. Mm -hmm. But um, in the case of Joseph and Mary, they never consummated their marriage. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine the, the fear of God he would have had for a blessed mother if he was carrying God in his room? Mm -hmm. in, in a Jewish mindset, I don't think we quite understand that. Yeah, 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 that's kind of and hard. Any references of, of Jesus' brothers and sisters are very often a misunderstanding of how the Greek mm -hmm. doesn't have a distinction brothers and sisters or cousins, right? Yeah, we, we, we see these documentaries, Father, and, and uh, the History Channel that spoke to, he had to have had other brothers referred to as my brother and my sister. And, uh, you know, there are always explanations about sure. this. Sure, so. if, you, if you Google Jesus Christ, you get a lot of different answers too, right? Yes, a lot definitely. of people love to speak about things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But not people very often are speaking from a certain authority or speaking with a certain knowledge. Yeah. Or they're speaking with a historical knowledge and a lot of, even archaeology, there's a lot of, you can put pieces together, but it, you're, you're, you never have all the pieces. It's true. And so you can get, draw conclusions, try to make up those pieces that can be wrong. And we would argue that um, because of the oral tradition of the church, we have people very clearly speaking about the perpetual virginity of Mary um, because of Scripture, a proper reading of Scripture. Mm -hmm. um, it speaks of uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary. When Jesus gave his mother to, to, to John at the foot of the cross, you know, she would have had, if he had other brothers and sisters, she would have been given to his family yes. members. Yeah, yeah. But he didn't, and so he didn't. That's true. There's many, I, I do, um, I, I guess, I, there's more I can say on that. I do want to speak about, come back to the Macklin Conception, if of I can. Because yeah. there, there are people say, who quote, and many, who raise a question, said, well, look at Romans, all have sinned. St. Paul says this, all have sinned. And what St. Paul is talking about in that moment, when he says, he's not talking about original sin in that moment. He's talking about personal sin, mm -hmm. right? And that we know that there, 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 are, there are people, persons that, have not fallen in a state of sin necessarily. 
-hmm. like children before the age of reason, you know, they don't have personal sin, right? So even though St. Paul's talking about all have sin, um, he's he's clearly there's a context in which it should be understood. Mm -hmm. And then Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve before the fall, you know, they didn't have any sin in that moment, right? And so the Catholics, we, we believe that Mary is another uh, unique condition that of someone who had no personal sin. No original sin, but also no personal sin. So we don't see that, that reading of Scripture, what St. Paul is saying is somehow um, meaning that Mary had to have some stain of sin. The other one, that, a Scripture verse that's very important uh, to, for the Immaculate Conception is that greeting of, of, um, uh, of the angel Gabriel in the Incarnation. Hail full of grace. And we say it every time we pray the Hail Mary, but I don't think we know the, the depth of that. Mm-hmm. But that's, he doesn't say, he, he doesn't even call his name. He, her, her name becomes full of grace. This is her identity. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is a, a big, big moment. Sometimes, unfortunately, scripture translates it, oh, highly favored one, or something like that at first. I've heard and, that as well. And, and it's unfortunate. It's not necessarily wrong per se, if you understand, but the Greek word is kekaritomene. And that's important in the original Greek. That verse, that tense, first of all, doesn't exist in the English language. It's, it's, that verse and that tense, it's saying that Mary's full of grace, meaning she's perfectly full of grace, always was full of grace, is now and always will be full of grace. The, the tense that is used, it, it's, um, it's this all-encompassing full of grace. So that one word of scripture, and what we say in what we call the mind, hail full of grace, when we pray the Hail Mary, um, is, in itself points to this, this that she was not there's no stain of sin whatsoever because where you're full of grace you can't have she's sin. not a regular woman she and and joseph her husband must have known that why you know she remained uh untouched that must have been a big deal no yeah no i think about it i remember i was in a seminary i said i've said this before too with you but think about your, your marriage it, when your wife calls you as, as to holiness when she calls you she knows your weaknesses and whatever it may be when she but she when she calls you to the man you're called to be you know you respond mm-hmm. you know sometimes she doesn't even have to say anything but just by her striving for goodness it can inspire you mm-hmm. can you imagine how saint joseph would have felt mm-hmm. being uh, le- uh, wedded to this beautiful woman of mary and having a, a child who is now his god you know <laughs> can you imagine how he would have felt the call you know to to, to respond to that and his goodness mm-hmm. it would have, every day it would have been uh, 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 a thanksgiving to God, but also an inspiration to live all the more. Wow. So her husband understood that she was full of grace and uh, played his role. And, uh, you know... I, if I can just clarify, I, how much he understood that, I don't know. But I, I, uh, I'm sure uh, the fact that she had this virgin birth and, and she conceived of the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. the reverence he would have had for her would have been... Uh, even beyond what a, a husband usually has for his wife. Of it would have been taken into the reverence that he, ha- he would have had when he prayed in the temple. Mm-hmm. Definitely, you know? definitely. She is a, a unique uh, rendition of the temple of the Holy Spirit. Wow. This, this deep conversation here, looking at uh, Joseph, the husband, and uh, how he saw his wife as, as a mother of God. Uh, we'll go to another break, Father. And when we come back, I want us to start off by talking about the, I know there are different appearances, apparitions of the Blessed Mother. And um, I know we're near one here in Belize, up in Mexico, uh, the Guadalupe. So we'll talk about that and other apparitions when we come back. You're watching Ask Your Father. We're back. You're watching Ask Your Father. I am your host, Vincent Palacio, and we're talking about the Blessed Mother. And uh, we left the last segment uh, starting a conversation about the different apparitions. And I find some of them very fascinating, Father. Um, and even most recent in New Mexico, I'm thinking a couple weeks ago, in the, in the, in the news, we heard about uh, the a Blessed uh, Guadalupe, the statue that was on loan to this small church in New Mexico, a small community, Catholic church. And uh, people observe her tearing up, just crying. And, you know, there's proof. This guy had recorded it and he was sharing it for the world to see on one of these world news. Uh, 
so there are different apparitions. And my, my question is, she appeared to, in Mexico City, to this Mayan man, and the way she looked was different than how she appeared to the kids in Europe. You know, we have a Blessed Mother in Fatima, in, <laughs> in, uh, the mother in uh, Lourdes, 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 Lourdes. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I'm, both, both, okay. both are both exactly. Are um, let's talk answer. about that, Father. Why sure. the difference? Why did she choose to show, show herself differently, different parts of the world? Um, there has a lot to do with the the way God wants to reveal Himself in a way that can be understood. Yes. And she, um, there's a, in, in a private revelation. There's there's a sometimes there's different symbols, sometimes mm -hmm. different signs that are used, that carry on a meaning to the person who views it. It's like a dream, let's say, if you dream something and you, you, you see something, you know the place you are, even if it's not the place, or it's, um, it's not necessarily a historical accuracy, but what's, message, what's important is the message is being communicated through. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, in the areas of apparitions, very often, especially Our Lady Guadalupe, mm -hmm. there's always a, a deeper meaning behind that, what's being taught. And I think... Uh, the Our Lady Guadalupe is a unique one. I think we can talk about that one. It relates to with the Immaculate Conception too. And that was the first one, right, Father? Uh, she's no. Oh, the, the first was apparition was Our Lady Pilar, oh. and it, and and correctly, actually, I should be a little cautious saying that because it technically it wasn't. She was believed to be still alive there. Because the first century is to Saint James, who was who was in oral tradition, she, he was being discouraged in the lack of response to his message in the gospel. And he went out towards Spain and, and said that she appeared to him standing on this pillar to encourage him. And, but she was still alive at that point, so that would be more like a bilocation right? as, as I speak about it. Um, but in regards to Our Lady Guadalupe, this was a time of turmoil in, in um, the, the meeting of the cultures. And uh, the church was established there already, Franciscans. And he was praying, you know, he was praying already deeply. And on December 9th, which was at that time the church was celebrating the Immaculate Conception. Mm -hmm. So it was on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, uh, Our Lady Guadalupe appeared to Juan Diego. Um, and Guadalupe itself is uh, the different means. Uh, she steps on the stone serpent. And the other one is, um, there is a, is, she's without stain, mm -hmm. the meaning of Guadalupe. And so there's a reference to this Immaculate Conception, even from then. Um, but the, as she comes in, she came as a mestizo. Huh? She came with this in a way that people um, could relate and see. And then her images, the, the stars was the constellation of the night sky. And the symbols of her dress were, there's a certain flower, one flower that meant divinity was over her womb. And so it's not that she just only comes in the way that people can receive her and receive the message, whatever the context of her complexion looks like. But the, even the, the way she's dressed and what she's holding and the message is, is associated with it, the message that she wants to give, even the time she appears and who she appears and what she asks for. All these, these things have, uh, have the encompassing a larger message yeah. about, um, to help encourage the church. But one thing for sure is that it should never bring something new. And there's, has, there's, there are statues... And that's on the, you mentioned New Mexico, about tearing. Uh, and this particular, the oil, somebody is tearing water or oils, you know. And the, the, the smell of roses is profound. Um, there are healings that, that occur. Uh, sometimes there's been tears of blood, you know, uh, that, have, uh, that uh, have messages of, of conversion and prayer usually, right? Um, and she, she as a mother is weeping for the sins of her children. Uh, and so it's, it's something that gets our attention, right? Um, but these apparitions, which are referred to private revelation, unlike something like we spoke about a dogma, someone doesn't have to believe it. This is not something that you have to believe. It's kind of at the time, right? However, to the extent that the messages do not contradict public revelation that what has been revealed in the church, why not believe it? You know, why would it take heed? It's ways of seeing the signs of the times. What is God trying to teach us here? Because it usually works in, with the church, the apparitions, and, and with the church's teaching, visible and invisible. I'll give you two examples. One, 
in the Immaculate Conception. I mentioned in the last segment that Pope uh, Pius IX, um, 1954, proclaimed the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. Well, this isn't pulled up of nowhere. Uh, the whole church has been believing this and carrying this out through the beginning since the beginning, but there were apparitions involved as well. Now, in 1830, uh, in Paris, we had the Miraculous Medal. It was it was actually originally called the Medal of the Immaculate, Immaculate Conception, and it's that uh, beautiful medal. And around that, there's a little prayer: as Mary conceived without sin, pray for us, have recourse to Thee. Right. And there's all kinds of symbols and images there. So that was 1930, and then here we go, um, 24 years later, we have the Pope proclaim the dogma. And after that, then you see four years later, in Lourdes, this, this little girl who cannot read, who have never he heard about that, in a small little community, uh, is picking up sticks and sees this woman, and prays, begins to pray a rosary with this woman. Right, by the grotto, by, the, by this area where there's water, I knew there was no water at the time. Um, and she, she encounters this woman, and she says, and who doesn't tell her her name. And this little girl, very innocent, and her name is Bernadette, now we know as St. Bernadette. And she tells, talks about what uh, she receives certain teachings from this woman, she's praying the rosary. Um, and the sequence of events go on. But one of the, eventually, after certain days of her returning, the woman lowers her hands and she, she cries up. She says, I am the Immaculate Conception. She doesn't say, I'm the mother of Jesus. I'm just say, I'm, and she's using this term four years later. In fact, that was, that was the clue for the priest when he was discerning. Because every kind of supernatural event, you always have to discern. And the priest was just kind of saying, okay, what's going on? Crowds gathering, they're talking. What's this, is, this, is this even happening? Or is this a story? Is one and two? If it is happening, is it of divine origin, God, or is it of another source, evil? Right? And so you're, you're constantly discerning. And then she, when she says that a lady responded when she asked for her name, I am the Maculous Conception. He, he was in shock because there's no way that little girl would have known that. You couldn't read. And it was only four years ago. In a time there was no internet, you know, and it did things didn't move as quick. And so, what I think was important is we here see is you see how the church is moving, and then God is moving as well with the church using through, through these apparitions. In this case, uh, with Mary, our Blessed Mother. And so, then now you see Our Lady of Fatima coming in 1917, at a time of World War One. Um, uh, a novena is pronounced by the Pope. Um, Praying, praying for this uh, mother of mercy and novena. And she comes and she appears, you know, and she, she, she appears in a powerful way in this time is to bring peace. You know, and first it is the angel of peace that came to prepare her way. The three children saw that. And then our Blessed Mother. Our Blessed Mother came, but she wanted one very incredibly important devotion that was associated with that with is that she wanted to bring. Um, Increase this devotion to her Immaculate Heart. And she mentioned there would be great trials, but in the end, the Immaculate Heart will try, will try them. And now here we find ourselves something very important, a very important message. Um, that can't, this, this, this revelation can't be separated from the history of the Church of or from Jesus. Right? If you go back again now centuries, there's uh, St. John Hughes. He was, uh, began, had a congregation of Jesus and Mary and he was known for promoting the, the devotion to the Sacred Heart, and the, the two hearts, actually. Uh, and this, this great saint, um, through great hard work, he, in promoting the devotion to the Sacred Heart, going back to when the beloved apostle, John, St. John, rested his head on the heart of Jesus in the chest of the Last Supper. Or it goes back to the moment when the, the pierced heart of Jesus was on the cross, and out flowed blood and water. Going back to that, he, through perseverance and prayers, he eventually got uh, this promotion, the ability to have a Mass offered on the Sacred Heart. We have that today. This Mass, because of his labors in the Church, that was approved by the Church. But he could only celebrate in his private congregation, a special liturgy in honor of the Sacred Heart. But one year later, Lo and behold, on the feast day of St. John, the beloved apostle, yeah. you, have Saint, you have Jesus appear to St. Margaret Mary Alaco, and then where he reveals his sacred heart. And from that, that sacred heart devo devotion, and through the hard work of the, especially the Jesuits and the great missionaries that they are, they, were, they went spread throughout, throughout yeah, the world. That's, that's a big one, Father. It's still, 
of the Venus and things for that. Oh, it's a it's an enormous one. It, uh-huh. a, there's more to the, the times of history that happened, but that it, it's that Sacred Heart and the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the two hearts very often are are to be reverent and, and, and shown devotion together, because you can't separate Jesus from. From Mary from Jesus. And that comes back to our initial conversation, right. talking about the, the, the Mary being above Jesus. We cannot separate the two. You can't, you can't put Mary above Jesus and you can't separate the two. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, you really can't. So it, you, it, when we say Mary, St. Louis de Montfort says, Mary says Jesus. And it, it just, you can never honor her too much. All right, let's, let's get to some, some practical things now, Father. Okay. We always do this sure. at, uh, as we, we, we come to the end of our show. Um, how can people, or what can people do to draw closer to the Blessed Mother? Um, in True Devotion to Mary, St. Louis de Montfort talks about um, external practices that, uh, that people can do to live this consecration to Jesus through Mary. And I think that would be a good um, suggestion. Uh, one, you can join a confer- confraternity of, that's devoted to Mary. Uh-huh. We, had, we used to have the Legion of Mary. Legion of that's Mary. Very important. Some churches still have that. Yes, yeah, so it's very, and it, I, I mean, we pray that that returns, you know, because uh, those are true soldiers of our Blessed Mother. Mm-hmm. And so that's great work for the laity. Um, the brown, wearing the brown scapular is a, is a beautiful, a beautiful devotion um, and, and, and garment of our Blessed Lady. I know in pri- private devotions, the green scapular, Father Jim Blunt um, mm-hmm. encourages. Um, there's, uh, those, there's the people who de- devoted to Mary should have a great devotion to the Incarnation. March 25th is a great feast day, or Christmas, right? mm-hmm. uh, not just bright lights and Santa Claus, but it really is a time when God becomes man. Of course. But in the womb of Mary. Yeah. Right? And so that octave of Christmas always finishes on January 1st, which is Mary, Mother of God. Mm-hmm. And so that, that is uh, someone devoted to Mary would have it be vo- very devoted to the incarnation. Another um, exter- practice is wearing a chain. Sometimes you see what people have been mm-hmm. devoted to wear a small chain around the wrist or the ankle that, uh, that speaks about... Uh, um, it's, it reminds them that they're slaves of Mary, you know, and to uh, whatever she asks, they will do. And knowing and being slaves of Mary, they're really slaves of Jesus. And slave is not in so, in, meant in a derogatory, in any way, lowering your dignity, because the one who we're slaves to is a beautiful mother and queen. And it's really a, a way of submitting our will to God's will. Um, another way I, I really like to highlight is, um, is from Scripture is the Magnificat, that thank you that mm-hmm. Mary had mm-hmm. in that encounter with that's, Elizabeth. It's a very powerful prayer. It's a prayer that I encourage people to pray every day yeah. um, or meditate upon. There's so much, it's so much scriptures in that. Yeah. And it reveals really this, Pope John Paul II, the great saint, he, he, he says that this reveals the spirit of Mary, that spirit that's in the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the way she loves her. And so I, by more we can make that Magnificat our own, I think the more, not only just the external practices of, of doing things for Mary, having a statue, at building a grotto is another way, these different things of honoring her, but to really share that spirit, that, that spirit of thanksgiving before God, with that magnificat, that thanksgiving, that humility that becomes our own, that, that thanksgiving, that constant thanksgiving to God. Of course. Father, so, can, can you access that magnificat prayer and then maybe we could close the show with it? I think that would be so appropriate. If you if you have it too, if it's not too far off, sure, I, I, I do. I mean, I, probably if you if you know it by heart, that, that would that would even. My be soul good. proclaims the greatness of the Lord. Not, my not, spirit, not, not quite oh, that. oh, oh sure. <laughs> I know you're eager. I'm but, ready to go. <laughs> of course, of course. But uh, one last point, Father, that um, you probably haven't stressed a lot on is praying the Rosary. Um, <laughs> How can I forget? Thank you. I know how important is praying the Rosary <laughs> in our walk. With, uh, with, you know, the I guess, blessed mother to her son Jesus. Oh, it's, it's enormous. I, it's fun. I think it, perhaps I just, perhaps I just think it, it just so, it's just so, and I must become so part of us, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the rosary is a meditation of scripture in the lives of Jesus and Mary. Um, it, it's, it's our weapon. And it's a, it's a prayer for saints. It's a prayer for, prayer for beginners. It's a great family prayer for children or the elderly. And you can pray in many different languages. And it's a, it allows us, it brings a family into, we're in the month of the family in June. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bishop Nicasio um, uh, has pronounced it, and quite, I think it, there's a lot of wisdom 
and reminding the church right now to really take a look at the family, encourage our families. And I've asked our, our parishioners um, in, in Divine Mercy families to, to take up the challenge to pray the family rosary. I, I, some of us, you know, to pray every day as a family, the rosary. Um, I, think, I think many will, you know, and some that maybe be just beginning, they may have to work up to it. But it really, is, when Our Lady appeared in Fatima and she wants, wanted devotion to her Immaculate Heart, she asked, she asked about this, um, that the rosary be prayed daily. I, I, I just, I ask people to really take that seriously, you know? Um, as I'm speaking in, in Fatima, there's also the first Saturday devotion too. I, so many ways of doing it. But there is, um, I, I just, I, I just, I don't know what else. What about you? You and your family prayer? Of like, course, how? of course. Uh, the rosary is a very instrumental part of our our daily prayer. So you don't, family. you just don't wear it around your no, neck. This is not fashion at all, brother. <laughs> this, this, the this, way you carry this, it. Huh? This, this is where it needs to be, right <laughs> on my heart, and it, and it and it plays a crucial role. Sure. And uh, you know, I remember when we had just started. I didn't know the different uh, mysteries and the different decades, and now you know I'm just reciting it. Sure. And at one, when I had just started, the rosary seemed like 20 minutes. And now I start the rosary, I see like in three, four minutes, it's, it's over. It becomes a part of you. And it, 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 I recommend it. So there you have it, viewers and listeners. Uh, Father Scott talking about the importance of the rosary. And some other things that you could do to close in your walk with the Blessed Mother uh, as we go to her son, our Lord and Savior, very important, uh, the, the bracelet and anklet thing. If we need to know more about this, you could uh, contact your priest and uh, he may could tell you more how you could walk closer with Christ through his mother. Uh, as we come to our wrap, I ask Father Scott to lead us with the Magnificat prayer uh, and then I'll wrap up just after that. Father, sure. we're ready now. Okay, this sounds good. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. In this day, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from the thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, for he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise to, he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you very much, Father, for leading us in that prayer. Uh, we'd like to thank you for, for staying tuned. I'd like to thank Father Scott for being with me this, uh, for this errand. You've been watching Ask Your Father. I am your host, Vincent Palacios. Thanks, Father. And may God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. <laughs>